The Beast of Tarzan, Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. This recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 3 Beasts at Bay. Slowly, Tarzan unfolded the note the sailor had thrust into his hands and read it. At first it made little impression on his sorrow-numbed senses, but finally the full purport of the hideous plot of revenge unfolded itself before his imagination. This will explain to you, the note read, the exact nature of my intentions relative to your offspring and you. You were born an ape. You live naked in the jungle. To your own we have returned you. But your son shall rise a step above his sire. It is the immutable law of evolution. The father was a beast, but the son shall be a man. He shall take the next ascending step in the scale of progress. He shall be no naked beast of the jungle, but shall wear a loincloth and copper anklets, and perchance a ring in his nose, for he is to be reared by men, a tribe of savage cannibals. I might have killed you, but that would have curtailed the full measure of the punishment you have earned at my hands dead you could not have suffered in the knowledge of your son's plight but living and in a place from which you may not escape to seek or succour your child you shall suffer worse than death for all the years of your life in contemplation of the horrors of your son's existence this then is to be a part of your punishment for having dared to pit yourself against n r p s the balance of your punishment has to do with what shall presently befall your wife that I shall leave to your imagination. As he finished reading, a slight sound behind him brought him back with a start to the world of present realities. Instantly his senses awoke, and he was again Tarzan of the apes. As he wheeled about, it was a beast at bay, vibrant with the instinct of self-preservation that faced a huge bull ape that was already charging down upon him. The two years that had elapsed since Tarzan had come out of the savage forest with his rescued mate had witnessed slight diminution of the mighty powers that had made him the invincible lord of the jungle. His greatest states in Uziri had claimed much of his time and attention, and there he had found ample field for the practical use and retention of his almost superhuman powers. But naked and unarmed to do battle with the shaggy, bull-necked beast that now confronted him was a test that the ape-man would scarce have welcomed at any period of his wild existence. But there was no alternative other than to meet the rage-maddened creature with the weapons with which nature had endowed him. Over the bull's shoulder, Tarzan could see now the heads and shoulders of perhaps a dozen more of these mighty forerunners of primitive man. He knew, however, that there was little chance that they would attack him, since it is not within the reasoning powers of the anthropoid to be able to weigh or appreciate the value of concentrated action against an enemy. Otherwise, they would long since have become the dominant creatures of their haunts, so tremendous a power of destruction lies in their mighty thews and savage fangs. With a low snarl, the beast now hurled himself at Tarzan. But the ape-man had found, among other things in the haunts of civilized man, certain methods of scientific warfare that are unknown to the jungle folk. Whereas a few years since, he would have met the brute rush with brute force, he now sidestepped his antagonist's headlong charge, and as the brute hurled past him, swung a mighty right to the pit of the ape's stomach. With a howl of mingled rage and anguish, the great anthropoid bent double and sank to the ground, though almost instantly he was again struggling to his feet. Before he could regain them, however, his white-skinned foe had wheeled and pounced upon him, and in the act there dropped from the shoulders of the English lord the last shred of his superficial mantle of civilization. Once again he was the jungle beast, reveling in bloody conflict with his kind. Once again he was Tarzan, son of Kala, the she-ape. His strong white teeth sank into the hairy throat of his enemy as he sought the pulsing juggler. Powerful fingers held the mighty fangs from his own flesh, or clinched and beat with the power of a steam hammer upon the snarling, foam-flecked face of his adversary. In a circle about them, the balance of the tribe of apes stood watching and enjoying the struggle. They muttered low gutturals of approval as bits of white hide or hairy blood-stained skin were torn from one contestant or the other but they were silent in amazement and expectation when they saw the mighty white ape wriggle upon the back of their king, and, with steel muscles tensed beneath the armpits of his antagonist, bear down mightily with his open palms upon the back of the thick bull neck, so that the king ape could but shriek in agony and flounder helplessly upon the thick mat of jungle grass. 
as Tarzan had overcome the huge Tarkaz that time years before when he had been about to set upon his quest for human beings of his own kind and color, so now he overcame this other great ape with the same wrestling hold upon which he had stumbled by accident during that other combat. The little audience of fierce anthropoids heard the cracking of their king's neck mingling with his agonized shrieks and hideous roaring. Then there came a sudden crack, like the breaking of a stout limb before the fury of the wind. The bullet head crumpled forward upon its flaccid neck against the great hairy chest. The roaring and the shrieking ceased. The little pig eyes of the onlookers wandered from the still form of their leader to that of the white ape that was rising to its feet beside the vanquished. Then back to their king, as though in wonder that he did not arise and slay this presumptuous stranger. They saw the newcomer place a foot upon the neck of the quiet figure at his feet, and, throwing back his head, give vent to the wild, uncanny challenge of the bull ape that has made a kill. Then they knew that their king was dead. Across the jungle rolled the horrid notes of the victory cry. The little monkeys in the treetop ceased their chattering. The harsh-voiced, brilliant-plumed birds were still. From afar came the answering wail of a leopard and the deep roar of a lion. It was the old Tarzan who turned questioning eyes upon the little knot of apes before him. It was the old Tarzan who shook his head as though to toss back a heavy mane that had fallen before his face, an old habit dating from the days that his great shock of thick black hair had fallen about his shoulders, and often tumbled before his eyes when it had meant life or death to him to have his vision unobstructed. The ape-man knew that he might expect an immediate attack on the part of that particular surviving bull-ape who felt himself best fitted to contend for the kingship of the tribe. Among his own apes, he knew that it was not unusual for an entire stranger to enter a community and, after having dispatched the king, assume the leadership of the tribe himself, together with the fallen monarch's mates. On the other hand, if he made no attempt to follow them, they might move slowly away from him, later to fight amongst themselves for the supremacy. That he could be king of them, if he so chose, he was confident, but he was not sure he cared to assume the sometimes irksome duties of that position for he could see no particular advantage to be gained thereby. One of the younger apes, a huge, splendidly muscled brute, was edging threateningly closer to the ape-man. Through his barred fighting fangs there issued a low, sullen growl. Tarzan watched his every move, standing rigid as a statue. To have fallen back a step would have been to precipitate an immediate charge. To have rushed forward to meet the other might have had the same result, or it might have put the bellicose one to flight, it all depended upon the young bull's stock of courage. To stand perfectly still, waiting, was the middle course. In this event, the bull would, according to custom, approach quite close to the object of his attention, growling hideously and barring slavering fangs. Slowly he would circle about the other, as though with a chip on his shoulder. And this he did, even as Tarzan had foreseen. It might be a bluff royal, or, on the other hand, so unstable is the mind of an ape, a passing impulse might hurl the hairy mass tearing and rending upon the man without an instant's warning. As the brute circled him, Tarzan turned slowly, keeping his eyes ever upon the eyes of his antagonist. He had appraised the young bull as one who had never quite felt equal to the task of overthrowing his former king, but who one day would have done so. Tarzan saw that the beast was of wondrous proportions, standing over seven feet upon his short, bowed legs. His great hairy arms reached almost to the ground, even when he stood erect, and his fighting fangs, now quite close to Tarzan's face, were exceptionally long and sharp. Like the others of his tribe, he differed in several minor essentials from the apes of Tarzan's boyhood. At first, the ape-man had experienced a thrill of hope at sight of the shaggy bodies of the anthropoids, a hope that by some strange freak of fate he had been again returned to his own tribe. But a closer inspection had convinced him that these were another species. As the threatening bull continued his stiff and jerky circling of the ape-man, much after the manner that you have noted among dogs when a strange canine comes among them, it occurred to Tarzan to discover if the language of his own tribe was identical with that of this other family, and so he addressed the brute in the language of the tribe of Kerchak. Who are you, he asked, who threatens Tarzan of the apes? The hairy brute looked his surprise. I am a cut replied the other in the same simple, primal tongue, which is so low on the scale of spoken languages that, as Tarzan had surmised, it was identical with that of the tribe in which the first twenty years of his life had been spent. I am a cut, said the ape. Moloch is dead. I am king. Go away, or I shall kill you. 
You saw how easily I killed Molak, replied Tarzan, so I could kill you if I cared to be king. But Tarzan of the Apes would not be king of the tribe of Akut. All he wishes is to live in peace in this country. Let us be friends. Tarzan of the Apes can help you, and you can help Tarzan of the Apes. You cannot kill a cut, replied the other. None is so great as a cut. Had you not killed Kalak, a cut would have done so, for a cut was ready to be king. For answer, the ape man hurled himself upon the great brute who during the conversation had slightly relaxed his vigilance. In the twinkling of an eye, the man had seized the wrist of the great ape, and before the other could grapple with him, had whirled him about and leaped upon his broad back. Down they went together, but so well had Tarzan's plan worked out that before ever they touched the ground, he had gained the same hold upon a cut that had broken Molak's neck. Slowly he brought the pressure to bear, and then, as in days gone by, he had given Kerchak the chance to surrender and live, so now he gave a cut in whom he saw a possible ally of great strength and resource, the option of living in amity with him, or dying as he had just seen his savage and heretofore invincible king die. Kagoda, whispered Tarzan to the ape beneath him. It was the same question that he had whispered to Kerchak, and in the language of the apes it means broadly, do you surrender? A cut thought of the creaking sound he had heard just before Molak's thick neck had snapped, and he shuddered. He hated to give up the kingship, though, so again he struggled to free himself, but a sudden torturing pressure upon his vertebra brought an agonized kagoda from his lips. Tarzan relaxed his grip a trifle. You may still be king, Akut, he said. Tarzan told you that he did not wish to be king. If any question you're right, Tarzan of the Apes will help you in your battles. The ape-man rose, and Akut came slowly to his feet. Shaking his bullet head and growling angrily, he waddled toward his tribe, looking first at one and then at another of the larger bulls who might be expected to challenge his leadership. But none did so. Instead, they drew away as he approached, and presently the whole pack moved off into the jungle, and Tarzan was left alone once more upon the beach. The ape-man was sore from the wounds that Molak had inflicted upon him, but he was inured to physical suffering, and endured it with the calm and fortitude of the wild beast that had taught him to lead the jungle life after the manner of all those that are born to it. His first need, he realized, was for weapons of offense and defense, for his encounter with the apes, and the distant notes of the savage voices of Numa the lion and Sheeta the panther warned him that this was to be no life of indolent ease and security. It was but a return to the old existence of constant bloodshed and danger, to the hunting and being hunted, Grim beasts would stalk him, as they had stalked him in the past, and never would there be a moment, by savage day or by cruel night, that he might not have an instant need of such crude weapons as he could fashion from the materials at hand. Upon the shore he found an outcropping of brittle igneous rock. By dint of much labor he managed to chip off a narrow sliver some twelve inches long by a quarter of an inch thick. One edge was quite thin for a few inches near the tip. It was the rudiment of a knife. With it he went into the jungle, searching until he found a fallen tree of a certain species of hardwood with which he was familiar. From this he cut a small straight branch, which he pointed at one end. Then he scooped a small round hole in the surface of the prostrate trunk. Into this he crumbled a few bits of dry bark, minutely shredded, after which he inserted the tip of his pointed stick, and sitting astride the bowl of the tree, spun the slender rod rapidly between its palms. After a time a thin smoke rose from the little mass of tender, and a moment later the hole broke into flame. Heaping some larger twigs and sticks upon the tiny fire, Tarzan soon had quite a respectable blaze roaring in the enlarging cavity of the dead tree. Into this he thrust the blade of his stone knife, and as it became superheated, he would withdraw it, touching a spot near the thin edge with a drop of moisture. Beneath the wetted area, a little flake of the glassy material would crack and scale away. Thus, very slowly, the ape-man commenced the tedious operation of putting a thin edge upon his primitive hunting knife. He did not attempt to accomplish the feat all in one sitting. At first he was content to achieve a cutting edge of a couple of inches, with which he cut a long, pliable bow, a handle for his knife, a stout cudgel, and a goodly supply of arrows. These he cached in a tall tree beside a little stream, and here also he constructed a platform with a roof of palm leaves above it. When all these things had been finished, it was growing dusk and Tarzan felt a strong desire to eat. He had noted during the brief incursion he had made into the forest that a short distance upstream from his tree there was a much-used watering place where, from the trampled mud up either bank 
it was evident beasts of all sorts and in great numbers came to drink. To this spot the hungry ape-man made his silent way. Through the upper terrace of the treetops he swung with the grace and ease of a monkey. But for the heavy burden upon his heart he would have been happy in this return to the old free life of his boyhood. Yet even with that burden he fell into the little habits and manners of his early life that were in reality more a part of him than the thin veneer of civilization that the past three years of his association with the white men of the outer world had spread lightly over him, a veneer that only hid the crudities of the beast that Tarzan of the Apes had been. Could his fellow peers of the House of Lords have seen him then, they would have held up their noble hands in holy horror. Silently, he crouched in the lower branches of a great forest giant that overhung the trail. His keen eyes and sensitive ears strained into the distant jungle, from which he knew his dinner would presently emerge. Nor had he long to wait. Scarce had he settled himself into a comfortable position, his lithe, muscular legs drawn well up beneath him as the panther draws his hindquarters in preparation for the spring. Then Bara, the deer, came daintily down to drink. But more than Bara was coming. Behind the graceful buck came another which the deer could neither see nor scent, but whose movements were apparent to Tarzan of the apes because of the elevated position of the ape-man's ambush. He knew not yet exactly the nature of the thing that moved so stealthily through the jungle a few hundred yards behind the deer, but he was convinced that it was some great beast of prey stalking Bara for the self-same purpose as that which prompted him to await the fleet animal. Duma, perhaps, or Sheeta, the panther. In any event, Tarzan could see his repast slipping from his grasp unless Bara moved more rapidly towards the ford than at present. Even as these thoughts passed through his mind, some noise of the stalker in his rear must have come to the buck, for with a sudden start he paused for an instant, trembling in his tracks, and then with a swift bound dashed straight for the river and Tarzan. It was his intention to flee through the shallow ford and escape upon the opposite side of the river. Not a hundred yards behind him came Numa. Tarzan could see him quite plainly now. Below the ape-man, Bara was about to pass. Could he do it? But even as he asked himself this question, the hungry man launched himself from his perch full upon the back of the startled buck. In another instant, Numa would be upon them both. So, if the ape-man were to dine that night, or ever again, he must act quickly. Scarcely had he touched the sleek hide of the deer with a momentum that sent the animal to its knees, than he grasped the horn in either hand, and with a single quick wrench, twisted the animal's neck completely around, until he felt the vertebra snap beneath his grip. The lion was roaring in rage close behind him as he swung the deer across his shoulder, and, grasping a foreleg between his strong teeth, leaped for the nearest of the lower branches that swung above his head. With both hands he grasped the limb, and at the instant that Numa sprang, drew himself and his prey out of reach of the animal's cruel talons. There was a thud below him as the baffled cat fell back to earth, and then Tarzan of the Apes, drawing his dinner farther up to the safety of a higher limb, looked down with grinning face into the gleaming yellow eyes of the other wild beast that glared up at him from beneath, and with taunting insults flaunted the tender carcass of his kill in the face of him whom he had cheated of it. With his crude stone knife he cut a juicy steak from the hindquarters, and while the great lion paced, growling back and forth below him, Lord Greystoke filled his savage belly, nor ever in the choicest of his exclusive London clubs had a meal tasted more palatable. The warm blood of his kill smeared his hands and face, and filled his nostrils with the scent that the savage carnivora loved best. And when he had finished, he left the balance of the carcass in a high fork of the tree where he had dined, and with Numa trailing below him, still keen for revenge, he made his way back to his treetop shelter, where he slept until the sun was high the following morning. End of chapter 3